Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. Well, today we continue our study in the book of 1 John. Pastor Caleb has been walking us through 1 John now for several months. And one of the distinguishing features of John's writing is his circular approach to the things he wants to teach his readers. Unlike Paul's letter to the Romans, which is very linear, progressing logically from one doctrine to another, John keeps returning to the same subject matter only from a slightly different angle. One pastor described John's letter as a winding staircase. As you ascend the steps, you come to the same view, only each time your view is broadened and filled out as you see things that you could not see from lower down. And that is what we encounter today. As John readdresses the privilege and duty we have as Christians to love each other, something John has already spent considerable time on in his letter. It's good to remember that John writes this letter as an eyewitness to Jesus and his ministry. According to 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, John saw Jesus with his own eyes. He heard Jesus preach and teach with his own ears, and he touched Jesus with his hands. As one of Jesus' disciples, John has intimate first-hand knowledge of who Jesus is and the message that he came to preach. And we know that John is from God. In 1 John 4, 6, he writes, We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. So, having been with Christ and having been commissioned by God to write this letter, you and I this morning can have confidence in the authority of God's word. And not just this morning, but every time we open our Bibles, we can have confidence that God is speaking to us. 1 John 5.13, John makes clear that he's writing to those who believe, whose sins have been forgiven, know God, and have God's word abiding in them. 1 John 2.12-14. In short, John is writing to Christians, to those who have been saved by God's grace, from God's wrath, by the precious blood of Jesus. Throughout his letter, John has been laying down doctrinal tests and moral tests. He's been answering the questions, what does a Christian believe? That's the doctrinal test. And what does a Christian do? That's the moral test. And though John wants his readers to run themselves through these tests and ask themselves these hard questions, he does so with confidence that they will pass the tests, thereby strengthening their assurance that they belong to God's family. 1 John 5.14 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. John does not write for the purpose of loading up burdens upon Christians impossible to bear. But John writes for giving assurance and the comfort that goes along with that assurance. So this morning, our text is primarily dealing with the moral test of our love for one another. The question before us is this. Do you love your fellow Christian? Do you love your brother and sister here at Kenora Bible Church? That's the test before us this morning. And we should recognize that this moral test is not in isolation or in opposition to the doctrinal test that Pastor Caleb preached on for the last two weeks, the test of discernment. If we, by God's grace and with the help of the Holy Spirit, properly discern between truth and error together as a body and unify around that truth, then we are going to naturally grow in love for each other. 
If you show me a marriage where the husband and wife are affectionate and warm towards each other, loving each other in practical ways, then I will show you two people who are united in mind on what they believe to be true about life's most important questions. A growth in discernment and unity around the truth will lead to a greater and deeper love among God's people. So with God's help, let's now wade into our text this morning. 1 John 4, verse 7 to 9. I'll read it again. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his Son into the world so that we might live through him. Our first point this morning is that God's children bear the resemblance of their father's love. Notice how John begins his address. He uses the word here again, beloved. And in that we see John's heart towards his people. It's warm, it's affectionate. They're the object of John's special love. He's writing to family, to brothers and sisters in Christ. And John is actually exhibiting the very love he admonishes his readers to portray. John is showing the love and affection that is shared between believers in his address. And he goes on to say, Beloved, let us love one another. It is interesting and might even seem to you a little bit strange that John admonishes genuine Christians to love each other. The reason I say this is because the rest of verse 7 and verse 8 indica indicate that Christian love is certain. It will be certain in true believers. It is going to happen. Look at the second half of verse 7. It says that the one who loves has been born of God and knows God. And verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God. A Christian is someone who has been born again and loves God. And according to John, the person who has been born of God will love their fellow Christian. It is going to happen. So why John? Why John would you command that which is inevitable in your readers? Why command Christians to love one another when it is their very nature to love having been born of God? And I believe that the answer to this is that God accomplishes, stirs up, and sustains brotherly love and affection in his people through the admonishments, commandments, and encouragements of Scripture. Through ordinary Bible reading, Bible teaching, Bible preaching, God ordains the end, which in this case is Christian love, and he ordains the means to reach that end, his commands in the scripture to love one another. God knows our ongoing struggles, our struggles with sin and pride and selfishness. And so he frequently reminds and admonishes us in his word to be who we already are, to act according to our nature, our new identity as his beloved children. And this is why time in God's word, whether in private or gathered together as we are here today, is essential. It is essential for the church to flourish. And it is essential for us as individual Christians to become more like Jesus in love for each other. A Christian out of the word of God and away from God's people is a Christian who is in spiritual danger. A person who is neglecting God's means of grace to grow and sustain them in love for each other. It's interesting also that John begins in 1 John 4, 7 with the finished product, which is Christian love. And then he lays out the ingredients to this love. John essentially works backwards from the final product of loving one another towards the key ingredients the origins of that love, which we see are God's love, new birth, and knowledge. 
So let's briefly examine each of these key ingredients to see where this love comes from and what is its nature. Let's begin at the end of verse 7 with knowledge and work our way backwards to love for one another. Knowledge. The one who loves knows God. This word know suggests far more than a mere knowing of facts about God. It carries with it the idea of an intimate and familiar knowledge. It is seen in the words of David when he writes in Psalm 63, Oh God, you are my God. For David, God is not simply Elohim, the creator God. He is his creator God. David belongs to God and God belongs to David. You might say that you know my father, Michael Cousin, and for most of you in this room, that would be true, at least at some level. But there would be a difference between what you mean when you say you know my father and what I mean when I say I know my father. And that is because my knowledge of him is based upon our relationship as father-son. And so it is with those who know God in the sense that John uses the word here in verse 7. This word know is the same word that Jesus used in John 17, 3 when he said, and this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is a knowledge of God that leads to eternal life. The one who knows God in this sense knows and has experienced his character. He knows the God of the Bible in an intimate fashion. He knows of his holiness, his greatness, and his justice. He knows of his mercy, his forgiveness, his grace, and especially this morning we see his love. And he's experienced all of these things coming together at the cross where Jesus became his substitute for his sins and God became his God. The one who knows God in this way has been changed by God's love and will have an inclination to love others who have been changed by this love. So we see then that knowledge of God is a key ingredient to Christian love. Secondly, again, working backwards, we see that the one who loves has been born of God. Where did this love come from? This is miracle love. It came from a supernatural rebirth of the Holy Spirit, which we often refer to as regeneration. This is the rebirth that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about in John 3.3, 3, when John writes, Jesus answered him, that's Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Christians have been born twice. Once from their mother's womb and once from God. And it is this second birth which makes them a child of God as God lovingly adopts them into his family. And something amazing begins to happen in that person. They start to resemble their heavenly father in love. We start to naturally love who God loves because we all belong to the same family. There is a new and natural affection for our spiritual family, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And you might have witnessed this natural affection between earthly family members. And I've seen it especially when my children get together with their cousins. When they're apart, they long to be together. And they ask their mom and I when the next time is that we're going to visit them. When they're together, there's an immediate connection even if they've not seen each other for over a year. They welcome each other warmly into each other's spaces and into their favorite activities. They get up early in the morning to see each other when they're first out of bed and they try to stay up as late as they can to continue seeing each other. There is a natural, instinctual love that comes from having some of the same blood running through their veins. Look around you, dear brother, dear sister. This is your family this morning. We have the same father. 
we too share in the same blood. The blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. It has brought us near to God. And as we draw near to God, we can't help but draw near to each other. I think we're getting a sense of the nature of the kind of love that God wants us to have for each other. Thirdly, again working backwards, we see that this love is from God. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. You and I cannot conjure up this love. We don't create it in ourselves and we do not will ourselves into it. We are a bone dry river when it comes to love. And God is the great fountainhead of that love for it is his very nature his disposition towards his creation is affection goodwill kindness and mercy all that is good and loving lovely in this world can be credited to god being a loving god on one hand god's love is a general love sometimes referred to as common grace and everyone experiences this love whether they are his enemies or his children Sunshine, food, health, art, sport, marriage, jobs, breath, the vehicle you drove here in, all of these are an expression of God's love and mercy towards you. In Matthew 5, 45, Jesus says that God makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. The psalmist writes in Psalm 145, 9, the Lord is good to all. His mercy is over all that he has made. And then there is God's special love. Or we could call it his saving grace. If you are a Christian, then this is the love that caused you to be born again and adopted you into God's family. This is the love that pursued you when you were God's enemy, saved you from his wrath and the fear of any and all condemnation. And it is the love that keeps you from falling away from God. Quite simply, this is the love that turned you from God's enemy into his child. All at the expense of God himself. And so now we're getting a greater sense of the nature of God's love and how we are to love each other. God's love is initiating. It moves towards us. It welcomes the stranger. It is sacrificial and costly. And so we have seen the three key ingredients to Christian love is knowledge, new birth, and God's love. Practically speaking, though, what does this look like? What does this kind of love look like between Christians? I think we would do well to take our cues from John himself. Let's look over to 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, where John will show us, at least in one sense, what this love looks like. 1 John chapter 3, 16 to 18. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and see his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. There is a full sermon here, obviously. In fact, Pastor Caleb has preached it a few weeks ago, and if you want, you can go back and listen to that. But I just want to highlight a couple of things. Number one, Christian love imitates Christ's love in giving up ourselves and our possessions to meet each other's needs. Number two, if we're going to give up ourselves and our possessions when someone in the church has a need, whether it be physical, financial, emotional, or spiritual, we are going to have to see that need, which means that we are going to have to spend time together and know each other well. And there's a third principle here as well. Though John is admonishing his readers and us through his, God's word to love each other by meeting each other's needs, there will be times that we are the ones in need. 
you will be in need. Some of us will be more needy than others, and that's to be expected and normal. There will be times of sickness, deep relational pain and losses, depression, job loss, extenuating circumstances in our families, and it is in these times that we are the ones in need of an open hand from a brother and sister. It is okay to be needy, to need help and love and support from each other. So after looking first at the key ingredients to Christian love, knowledge, new birth, God's love, the nature of God's love towards us, and some helpful practical principles that John has laid down for Christian love, the claim that John is going to make in verse 8 makes a lot of sense. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. And here we come to the moral test. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So run yourself through the test this morning. Do you love your brothers and sisters at KBC? The question is not, do you love them perfectly? But do you love them at all? Do you have a natural affection for them? Do you love them as a result of God loving you? And do you open your hand to them in their time of need? If after self-examination, the honest answer you come to is, no, I don't love God's people. Perhaps you even despise them. Maybe you're here against your will. You're here because someone made you come. I don't know. But if you cannot claim to love God's people, you cannot claim to know God. According to verse 8, the one who has encountered the God of the Bible, a God whose very nature is love, that person will love God's people. Not perfectly, but they will love Intimate knowledge of God, being born of God, and receiving God's love changes a person. It does something. Dear friend, if you do not love God's people, then you do not belong to God. You remain His enemy, and you are still under His just judgment. And unless you come to know this God through repentance and faith in Christ unless you trust that Jesus Christ will save you from God's wrath, then that wrath will be yours for all eternity in hell. But friend, please listen. This morning, God is love. And out of his abundant love and mercy, he offers you total forgiveness if you will accept his terms of peace. And those terms are to be seen very clearly in verse 9, which we will be getting to shortly. Let us remember, though, John is writing to Christians, to believers. And one of his chief aims is that his readers will have assurance of their salvation. So if you can say this morning that you love the Christians in this room, as perfect, as imperfect as that love may be, then you can know with confidence that you know God and you are his child. Your love for God's people gives evidence that you have been saved by God's grace. So rejoice. You are his. You belong to him. You are his child. Rejoice in what God has done to you through Christ and praise him for the love that he has put in your heart for one another. And even as our hearts are assured this morning that we belong to God, don't you desire to love God's people more? I know I do. Oh, don't you want to love better and more freely so that you would regularly move towards others instead of waiting for someone to move towards you? Don't you want to be free from the fear of others that wonders whether your effort to love will be well received? Don't you want to be free 
from selfishness that clings to your time and energy and possessions instead of holding them with an open hand towards each other? It is hard to love God's people. And there are many times where our love smolders instead of burning brightly. And what we need and what John knew his readers needed And what God knows we all regularly need is the gasoline of the gospel reapplied to our hearts so that our love for each other would flame up. We need to hear again of the matchless love of God in sending his only son to bring us into his family. And so as we work through verse 9, My prayer, which it's been all week, is that the wonder and amazement of God's love towards you and me, completely unearned, unmerited, undeserved, would stir up and reawaken in us a fresh love for Christ and his people. So let's read verse 9 together. Verse 9, 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. In this the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Our second and last point this morning is the ultimate display of God's love is that he sent his son. At the start of verse 9, John tells us that God's love was made manifest among us. The word manifest means to be visible or to be revealed. So something has been revealed to John and the apostles. And it is the result of God and the result of his love. It's the result of a loving God doing something very loving for mankind. And so I think of two natural questions that come to mind. How has God shown this love and why has he loved in this way? How has God's love been revealed to John and the other apostles? And why did God love in this way. How? Well, John answers his question right away. That God sent his only son into the world. That's how. And that is awesome. God sent his only son into the world. It would take a thousand sermons to unpack that sentence. And we're going to try to do it some justice in two minutes. Notice God is doing the sending. Once again, God is the initiator. God is the promise keeper. He is doing it. He does it because he is a loving, promise-keeping, covenant-keeping God. In this little sentence, we see the fulfillment of a hundred Old Testament promises that God made to send a Messiah, a Savior. The first one is all the way back in Genesis 3, where God promised that the offspring of Eve would come to do battle with Satan and crush his head. John, being an eyewitness to Jesus and his ministry, can look back and say, it's happened, I've seen it, God has fulfilled his promises, Christ has come. And notice that John wants his readers to know that Jesus was not one of many sons that God sent, but his only son, his dear and precious only son. This could be translated as only begotten son, meaning that Jesus is God's one and only son from all eternity, the second person of the Trinity. God has sent his only son into the world. Jesus took on the nature of man while retaining his divine nature so that he could be the perfect God man who would carry out the plan of redemption. The promise to Mary from the angel Gabriel has come to pass. In Luke 1, 30 to 31, we read, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. There it is. John says it has happened. He has seen it. He has heard it. He has touched Jesus. Jesus has come. He's condescended. He became Emmanuel, God with us. He was born as we are. He was born in obscurity. He came to the world that had been broken by sin and he put on flesh. 
The songwriter says it well when he writes, King of all days, O highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. And while Christ was in the world, we know what he did. The Bible testifies that Jesus fulfilled every righteous requirement of the law. That though he was tempted in every way that we are, yet he was without sin. In short, he lived the perfect life that God demands of all of us. A life of perfect love and obedience to his Father. This is love, dear church. That God would send his only son to become like us and to live perfectly for us. God has sent him, not to judge the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And how are we saved? After keeping God's righteous demands of the law perfectly, Jesus goes to the cross willingly and dies. No one took his life for him, but he freely and willingly laid it down in obedience to his Father and in love for God's children. On the cross, Christ absorbed the wrath of God that should have fallen on me and on you. It should have been ours. But for any and all who repent of their sins and trust in Christ, leaning entirely on him to save us, this wrath is gone forever. It has been taken care of. There is no more condemnation. You are free from sin and death and hell, and you belong to God. You are his precious, dear child. You are Jesus' dear brother and sister, and none can take that from you. You are safe and secure in Christ. And when your thoughts and your feelings betray that truth, as time to time it does preach to yourself, Christ is mine, for I am his. He has purchased me once and for all with his precious blood. Oh, this is love, brothers and sisters. And oh, that this love would stir us up in love for one another. Lastly, while in the world, Jesus did one more thing which we dare not pass over and which is inseparable from the question that we're getting to, which is why has God loved us in this way? According to God's perfect word, Jesus did not stay dead. But after three days, he rose again physically from the grave and appeared to John and the other disciples and hundreds of others. Christ's resurrection from the dead was essential. It declared the acceptability and sufficiency of his sacrifice on the cross. Christ accomplished all that his father sent him to do. The resurrection reaffirmed the death blow to the power of Satan and sin and death for God's children. And it made certain the newness of life that we possess as God's children. And it secured the future resurrection that we will experience. And this brings us to the end of verse 9 and the answer to the question, why? Has God loved us in this way? Why has God loved us in this way? And John gives the answer at the end of verse 9. So that we might live through him. Notice first that there is a purpose. God doesn't save us for no reason. He does not save us to then leave us as we are. He saves us so that we might live and the word here, might, is not to be interpreted that there's a chance that we will not live. Some translations have used the word may instead of might, and that might do a better job at what John intends to say here. What John is saying is that God sent Jesus to open up the way of life for us. What was once impossible and unsure has been made possible and sure. We may now experience something new, namely life, where before all we knew was death. 
And when John says, so that we might live through him, what is mainly in view is the brand new identity and life that we now possess since we have been born of God. A life that leads to such things as love for one another. Eternal life may also be in view here, but within the context, John is speaking mainly of the newness of life of the believer. And I think 1 John 3.14 is really helpful, where it says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. What does this life produce? It produces love for the brothers. And so one of the primary reasons that God has displayed his love to us through the sending of his own son is so that we would love one another as evidence of our new life in Christ. Lastly, and this is a great comfort, notice that this newness of life is through him. It is through Jesus. Just as we are not able to create this life in ourselves, we are not able to sustain it by ourselves. And that is good news for weak and weary Christians who continue to fight with sin. We are not able to love each other in our own strength, but only through an ongoing reliance in Jesus. The fruit of Christian love grows as we remain attached to Jesus, who is the vine. And in this, Christ gets all the glory and we get all the help. So in conclusion, brothers and sisters who are here this morning, beloved, let us love one another. May the assurance that you belong to God, eternally safe and secure in his arms, set you free from all the things that hinder your love for each other. May our affection and practical love towards each other be a testimony to Kenora that Christ saves and it is sweet to belong to his family. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for speaking. We thank you for leaving a witness in your word to us. And we thank you, Father, for your immense love, which we see primarily in the sending of your son, Jesus Christ. And I just pray for a fresh sense, a fresh awareness, a fresh knowledge of this truth in our own lives. And as we embrace the truth of these things that God, you've sent your son to give us new life, to save us and adopt us and free us, that we would be so secure in that truth that we would no longer restrain ourselves from loving each other. We would no longer be hindered by sin and fear and doubt. We thank you, God, that you are patient and merciful, tenderly working in us, and we trust that you will do that and perfect the work that you've begun in us until Christ returns. And it's in his name I pray. Amen.